Today on In Good Faith, I'm excited that it's a book club episode. We do this once a quarter where we get together, we read a book, we have some of our folks on staff here from In Good Faith, and then we invite people who actually know what they're talking about. And we're glad to have two of those guests with us today. I'm Stephen Cap Perry, host of In Good Faith. With me in the studio is senior producer Heather Bigley. Hello. And our producer Austin Ball. Hey, everyone. As well as our designated experts for the day, we've got Sydney Balif, who's a grad from BYU in interdisciplinary humanities. And she's hoping to get a PhD in philosophy with a special emphasis on love and forgiveness. Sydney, thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks for having me. Also with us today is a, a friend of mine for years, Stephen Nordstrom. He calls himself a fellow pilgrim on the way and a student of a, the vast expanse of human experience, trying to build up community centered on love and care. He's a financial analyst supporting hospitals in Utah County. And he's made his spiritual home with the congregation of St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Provo for the past 10 years. We are talking today about the book, The Universal Christ. And this is by Father Richard Rohr. And I, I want to read the subtitle for this, How a Forgotten Reality Can Change Everything We See, Hope For, and Believe. And he talks in the introduction that of all things he hadn't spent a lot of time focusing on directly was... Jesus and Christ. So I'm glad he took the time, wrote this book that came out in I think 2021. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am I am wondering because you have a well uh, dog-eared copy with lots of notes, Stephen. When did this book first come to your attention, and and what did you like about it at first? So Richard War is one of those people that uh, people in various religious traditions, hear about and uh, gravitate towards either in appreciation or in opposition to what he says. He's mm. kind of a, 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 a figure that either appeals or, or doesn't. Um, and it becomes clearer as you read through this book, but uh, why? Because this is, as I think he says it, um, a distillation of some of the, the, the biggest concepts that he's been sitting with and working on for his entire life um, as a as a priest, as a contemplative, as a founder of a, a, a community of contemplation and action. And so uh, in the various podcasts that existed uh, in the world, this this name came up and I got turned on to Richard Rohr. I read a number of his books. And so when this one came out, I was very eager to to get to know it uh, as well. So there is actually a podcast uh, where some of the students of the Center of Action and Contemplation walk through the book chapter by chapter with um, Richard Rohr. Yeah, and that would that would be it. fun to listen to it as, as we read right. through. Right, I recommend it. It's called... A, Another name for everything, which is a quote from this book, actually. So, yeah. yeah. And, and Sydney Balif, how did you first come to the book, and how did it first interest you? Um, I have a friend in England, and we were one day chatting on the phone about our simultaneous faith crisis that we were having a hard time navigating our relationship with the Savior and our relationship with the institution of our church. Um, and he sent me this book by surprise in the mail. And it was like a beam had entered in my mailbox and I ran and got it and I couldn't put it down. Uh, and in fact, we talked about it later and it was like an answer to all of our prayers, um, seeking for some reconciliation between the term religion and faith and belief in Christ and Jesus. So that's how I found the book. Mm. I, I came to this book because as, as a... Uh, aspiring old person <laughs> who was and I checked off some of the boxes on on the list to get there um, I had read Richard Rohr's Falling Upward which talks about first half of life second half of life which according to him I am in the middle of right now and so I became just quite interested in his view of the world and Stephen like you said he can be a controversial figure because yes he's a Franciscan he comes from that tradition and yet other people would say, I'm not sure you're even Catholic. This stuff you're talking about <laughs> is so universally spiritual in nature, which 
Actually, I've really liked, as I've been reading, to try and be open to. And Richard Rohr has stepped away from doing uh, speaking engagements, and this is probably the closest we'll ever get <laughs> to having Richard Rohr on the show, even though we've loved him and we've reached out to him multiple times. We were even at the Center of Action and Contemplation last year, um, and we saw the wonderful tree that he discusses in this book, uh, Planted in the Back, and this huge tree that kind of focuses your mind mm. on the natural and the spiritual and your connection to it. I think for us, it it was really important to get a chance to talk about something that Richard Rohr is is putting out into the world um, and exposing our listeners to it. So, yeah, the closest we got was we waved to him from the parking <laughs> lot. We saw him getting out of his car, and yeah. and he's getting older. He was using his cane, and we thought we'll wave. We don't want to bother him. He looked like <laughs> we're not going to rush like w- groupies. <laughs> <he> was, <laughs> <laughs> we resisted. Right. So. One of the first things he does is he talks about what is Jesus and what is Christ. And he says, Christ was not just a last name. Or a last name at all, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a book of redefinition, right? I think largely. Um, Richard Rohr is taking all these concepts that many of us as practicing Christians have just accepted and and sort of— the, the doctrines that have come down uh, traditionally to us and asked us to re-examine what's going on with them, what's behind them, why they got started in the first place. And so this idea that um, there's a Jesus who's in the Bible and who is um, the Son of God. We spent all this time talking about how He is God or He is a manifestation of God, um, but we haven't talked a lot about what He actually did in His life and how He helped other people and how He reached out to folks. Um, and then there's this idea of the Christ, which is something separate, and the idea of uh, this permutation in all of creation, right, um, of that Jesus is this manifestation of God, but in fact, God is manifested in all of us and all of creation. And if we took that seriously, if we understood that more, our relationships with each other would change. Our relationships with the world would change, with the natural world. Um, our relationships to institutions, to empire would change, right? And this to me um, is something I've been thinking about a long time. And I think um, when Sydney talks about, you know, wrestling with institutions versus a uh, personal relationship with um, Jesus, this is, I think, Richard Rohr is going right there. He's saying, yes, we have institutions and we have traditions, but we also have, you know, these ideas that we need to explore and a relationship we need to explore. Um, There's this kind of mystical through line in Richard Rohr's thinking, I I believe, where there is an underlying unity. All is one, and that's Christ. He's the divine it in a sense he actually goes beyond gender because the christ is so transcendent to him it's indwelling in every instantiation of matter of life and that is what enables us to sort of belong in a really radical sense to everything else and he calls it morphic resonance to be able to to resonate with it and to see ourselves in each other I thought it was really cool that he, he he talks about the necessity of this concept of something universal, something divine or Christ, long before Jesus was born. And in fact, that in the very creation of the universe, whether that's Big Bang or Snap of the Fingers or whatever that might be, that that thing that we call Christ universally is already in everything that exists which I thought was kind of nice. And I see touch points with the way the tradition I was brought up with, which says this thing called the light of Christ goes out and is part of all things. And a fun thing I think about a book like this is where I see, okay, this touches on a few things I've been raised with, and it also touches on all these other things from other traditions. And he talks about the great schism just after the year 1000 when sort of Eastern Christianity went one way and, and with the belief in mysteries and Western Christianity sort of took over with more of uh, these are the sacraments that get you there rather than there's knowledge and, and this particular experience you have to have with God. So I wonder if we could just t- talk about Things in the book, and you can just sort of pull your favorite chapter or the thing that 
maybe puzzled you the most, but something that you connected with either in total agreement or, wow, I've got to think more about this. I can start. Great. I was always puzzled growing up in my faith tradition. We have the first Sunday of every month, we have um, an open mic, for lack of a better term, where people can get up and just share their testimony. And it always puzzled me that people had such a definitive, narrow view of what God is and who God is. And they'd say, God is this. And it, it never quite resonated with me. And then I went and served my mission in Thailand. And it felt like the colors and the kaleidoscope of God finally came to my field of vision where the definition was something far more dynamic and far less uh, definitive as I had grown up believing it was. And on 51, he uh, says, it's the quote, the first quote in italics on that page, you tend to create a God who is just like you, whereas it was supposed to be the other way around. Did it ever strike you that God gives up control more than anybody in the universe? God hardly ever holds on to control, if the truth be told. We do, and God allows us every day in every way. God is so free. And I loved what Heather said about this is a a book about redefinition. It's redefining my relationship to God, how I understand God. And I think often I pigeonhole him to fit my the mold I've created for him in my life instead of my life being a mold for him. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting and, and, and caused me to pause on my knees during prayer and, and not determine how he would respond, but instead allow him to be completely free and relinquish control as I see him relinquish control in my life. I like this idea of the, of, of I mean, he, Richard Rohr really is sort of cracking open sort of what are our cultural beliefs and what are, what is, what is available to us if we can let go of the cultural beliefs, right? And, you know, as Sydney said, some of us really struggle with a culturally infused um, Christianity that uh, that wants to center national identity and race and uh, class and all of these things. Um, and then to sort of find someone who's writing about um, that change is, this is all about change. This is all about evolution, right? And when we talk about, um, you know, we often say um, people need to repent, but really what we're talking about is they need to change their mind. He's interpreting the language of the New Testament here. They need to change their mind about a couple of things, many things, uh, perhaps. And only through change do we arrive at perfection. Um, and that, to me, is both scary, right? I think that's an incredibly frightening concept. Um, and I think it's also reassuring, too. I guess it depends on where you are in the process. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this idea that I need to let go of some of the things that have privileged me and make me feel like I'm at the center of everything and recognize my space or my relationship with other people and with God in a new way. Um, and that, to me, I, I think is so important for me to hear um, as I sort of continue I'm I'm not quite in the middle of my second half, but I'm <laughs> I'm getting close to the middle of my second half, and so uh, yeah. Something I had to put on the shelf is my insistence on understanding what I'm reading before I move on, and I do, I can't always do that with this book. In fact, it says in the the preface, which was written by Brian McLaren, also that uh, Richard Rohr says himself, I can't just tell you this and have you understand it. Just trust me and, and and be willing to not understand parts of this as you go through the process. So I found little places where I thought, I think I've had glimpses of that. This uh, on, on uh, page 15 really struck me. He says, my point is this, when I know that the world around me is both the hiding place and the revelation of God, I can no longer make a significant distinction between the natural and the supernatural, the holy, the profane. Basically, it's learning to see God in everything, which I'm not super good at, but I've had glimpses in learning to see God in everyone. And hopefully, by extension, I can just feel that kinship or, or this the dis disillusion of separation between me and, and other people. Stephen, you said that you like to give this book to people. So what about it motivates you to do that? Well, I think it touches upon kind of like a, a faith journey that I've been on for my whole life, but, you know, more intensely um, 
over the past 15 years or so. And uh, the that feeling of not quite understanding uh, that you mentioned, Steve, that's that happens to me a lot more in Richard Rohr's writings than in others. Uh, there's something there, there maybe that invites like repeated interaction. Mm. And I agree. So I just recently reread this book again, and it's a different book than I remember from pre-pandemic, from the first time that I read through um, this text. Uh, I was probably paying a little bit closer attention this time, knowing that I was coming on the podcast. <laughs> but uh, I, I appreciate that uh, you, you pass through these same words, and yet they mean something different because we've passed through something um, individually and collectively um, that, that has changed us. And um, I think that's the point, like what you're talking about, that there, we get so intent on putting things into categories mm. of this is the good stuff, this is the bad stuff, this is the right things, this is the wrong things. Um, draw, so it helps us orient ourselves in a world that is doing that all over the place and is putting us in categories too. Um, and yet Richard Rohr, um, through this book, um, is trying to invite us to a, a concept that he says is, uh, you know, from the beginning – you know, and is maybe the essence of God is that it's all in relationship. That it that and he calls this this is Trinitarian because it is lover, beloved, and the interrelationship of that those mm. those two. And it's inviting us all into understanding that everything is interconnected in that way. And it's only when we don't accept it that we're falling out of that love relationship or that we're not understanding it. And and yet there are moments, like you talked about, where we get glimpses or where we reconnect and and it's like regrounding us towards this idea of the, the divine mind or the Christ consciousness. Um, yeah. I love what you said, Stephen, because what it seems to me throughout the book and on every page screams at me is the interconnectedness is there only if we have the eyes to see it. Marilyn Robinson talks about this in Gilead where she says transfiguration is everywhere, but who has the courage to open their eyes Mm -hmm. and witness it? Because that's implicating. When you see God in everyone, you see Christ in everyone, that demands a certain kind of treatment. And throughout his ministry, Christ is not changing minds, I don't think. He's changing vision. He changes how we see people and how we see trials. And I also loved how you said it when we pass through this book, as we pass through like trials or things in our life, it changes the way that we see and the way that we feel and the way that we're oriented to our, towards ourselves. And um, Austin and I took a class together, and our professor quoted this Elizabeth Barrett Browning uh, quote, which is on page 55. And she says, Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. And it's this obsession with vision that I'm I'm currently having, especially with Christ, where a Christ-colored glasses changes the way that, <laughs> that you walk through the world. Uh-huh. And that's what this book does for me, is it the universal Christ reimagines my sight entirely, just as I think Christ asks us to reimagine how we see the world in the New Testament. Another quote that ties in with that is, R- Richard Dorr says in this book, once a person recognizes that, that God is hidden in, the invisible within the visible, it is hard to ever be lonely in this world again. And I thought, I want to feel that way. I want to be that connected. This is In Good Faith. It's time we're going to take just a a break in our book club edition here, and we'll be right back. This is In Good Faith, and it's a book club episode where we're talking about the book, The Universal Christ, How a Forgotten Reality Can Change Everything We See, Hope, and Believe. It's by Father Richard Rohr. To what you said, Sydney, about Jesus and vision, or Christ and vision, uh, somewhere in this book, I'm trying to find it, Richard Rohr talks about Christ's announcement, I am the light of the world. And he says, the light is not the object of our vision, it's kind of what facilitates or by which we see. And his definition of a mature Christian is someone who can see Christ 
in everything else. We we come to that um, and to him to see as he sees. He says, you know, we have faith in Christ in order to have the faith of Christ. And that if God becomes what he loves, we will also become as Christ is in the way that he sees and relates to others when we, when our eyes are single to his glory. You know, that same page struck me. Interestingly, it was the sentence after the one you mentioned that he says, I am the light of the world. But then later he turns around and said, ye are the light of the world. <laughs> it's like, wait, that was you. Right. What do you mean by that? And so I loved thinking of, about that. Like you say, by which you see things, maybe other people, the physical world, animals, whatever it might be. But then also to start to see, wait, what do I see of that in me? Yeah, I love that because uh, you do a Richard Rohr thing where he'll say, how did we miss this? <laughs> yeah. He says this all the time. Like it's, it's right there in front of us because it's, you know, in the scriptures, those two phrases are not. I like when he says, check it out. Apart, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. How did we miss this though? That Christ is the light of the world and we are the light of the world mm. too. Like the connection is that we are in, we, we are in that Christ that, that emanates throughout and, and recognizing that it transforms us and then it goes on to have the potential to transform the world. C can I ask something experiential? Like, I'd like to hear ab about experiences of that waking up or noticing that in your life. I'm a musician. Um, I, I think that the moments of greatest maybe connection or... Um, entering that understanding or that flow space mm. happened to me in music. Um, not just listening, but most, most often through participating in, in music. Um, I sing in choirs. I sing in a lot of BYU choirs back in the day and love those experiences. Um, they, they maybe like helped me understand a, this idea that I, a choir is a group of people trying to do the same thing all at once in their own separate ways, gathering mm. together something that becomes even more beautiful together than it would be separate. And, um, yeah. I, I, I love what you just said about not just listening, but the participation yeah. was more. Mm -hmm. And so we can, in a way, quote, listen, unquote, to scripture or thoughts, but then we're we're hopefully we want to participate in the music and literally singing i mean you are your body is actually vibrating yeah making the notes that right. are part of and i think there's a research out there that says that your heart rate like starts synchronizing coinciding, synchronizing with the others who are singing with you um that and your breath you know uh all of these things are deep and i i think the the resonance not just literally, literally, but metaphor <laughs> metaphorically, like really has an effect on on your ability to see that interconnectedness. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think it's beautiful. You talked about this macro level of this unification or this resonance, where you can actually have this physical manifestation of that mm. in in the body with music. And I think that's possible on an interpersonal level between two people. That there is, you're able to have this micro level of unification that he talks about on page seventy. He gives this definition of love when we're truly in love, which I think is a description of what you were talking about, that choir um, feeling. We move out of our small individual selves to unite with another. And then he goes on to explain this moment where you befriend someone who might be alone or might not have social capital for you. Um, and I think the experience I am thinking about is not a moment, unfortunately, of great harmony and excitement and feeling full but of dissonance with someone um i was being chastised by a professor for something that i said and i was i felt very unfairly mm. um accused of something and and we had just gone back and forth and i remember looking at him and feeling this this i was awake and this inner aliveness as roar talks about for him and where he was coming from. And later on, we had a conversation that he had um, a baggage. He had a backpack of other emotions he was feeling that came out in this conversation. But it was amazing to me that I was able, in a moment of contention, 
Mm-hmm. That all dissipated when I saw him in the way that Rohr talks about, stripped of these other conventions or structures or institutions that I had placed on him, and it was just the way that Christ, I think, would see him, hopefully. So you were able in that moment to not be swallowed up and sort of completely identified with that emotion of injustice. You were able to step out and observe enough that something else could happen, I think. Yeah. That's cool. I I love the paragraph on that page where he says, um, love, which might be called the attraction of all things toward all things, is a universal (laughs) language and underlying energy that keeps showing itself despite our best efforts to resist it. I love this. It's so simple that it's hard to teach in words, yet we all know it when we see it. There is not a native Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, Islamic, or Christian way of loving. There is not a Methodist, Lutheran, or Orthodox way of running a soup kitchen. There is not a gay or straight way of being faithful, nor a black or Caucasian way of hoping. We all know positive flow when we see it, and we all know resistance and coldness when we feel it. All the rest are just labels. Mm -hmm. And I think you move to something higher level in that experience. At least that's the way it speaks to me. And I like this. There's no Lutheran way to run that. Although they do run some very good. I mean, <laughs> Maybe we I, should take some, cl- some yeah, tips if, from if the If I'm Lutherans. going to go to a potluck, <laughs> I might choose the Lutherans because they're expert at the, you know, the casseroles and the hot hot dish and all. <laughs> what are you talking about? We're the, we're the casserole experts. Mm-hmm. Are we? Okay. You're not potatoes. I, I, that's my, I, I thought we were the jello experts. My ego but. leaping up. <laughs> um, I was just going to share a story the first time I really realized this. I had read a short story. It's called The Egg. And it begins with this guy dying in a car crash, and he meets what he perceives to be God. And God's like, okay, um, you're eventually going to become like me, but I'm going to have to send you back to Earth again um, so that you can get a little bit more experience. This time you are going to be, you know, a Chinese peasant woman in the 13th century. He's like, but that's in the past. He's like, well, time works differently here. (laughs) And um, actually, every person that you will meet is you, just in another incarnation. So every time you do a kindness or, you know, do a harm, you're doing it to yourself. And it was the first time I really sort of apprehended like, oh, maybe there's a unitary kind of feeler behind all of this. And it it is Jesus because, you know, in our faith, we believe that he went through in the atonement, every kind of experience, both painfully and joyfully that we can have, but that it would have been different if he had undergone that with the knowledge that he was the son of God and that he was who he was, that he had to actually do it from our perspective. And so that, that act enables him to be in me now and to be in everybody now. And that was pretty mind-blowing. And that's when I started to see, like, yeah. Um, it was sort of like that um, experience that Houselander has at the beginning of this book. On the train. She sees Christ in everyone. And if Christ is in them, everyone is in Christ, everything is in me. And uh, that changed my spiritual outlook pretty profoundly. In the middle of an ongoing (laughs) um, experience, which is, you know, um, so many women in my family die of cancer. And, uh, you know, my aunt, when I was in my 20s, got cancer and was dying of it. And I'd heard of other of cousins dying and of, of other people dying, and I hadn't really paid attention because I was 20 and invincible. And then uh, I sat with my aunt and listened to her talk to the, the genetic counselor mm-hmm. about all the people who had died of cancer. And then she died of cancer, and then my cousin, who's younger than me, got cancer and died, and then her mother died of cancer. And there have been all these deaths. We have these discussions in the family. What does it mean to heal? What does it mean to be made new by God? And we have some people in the family who say, Jesus is ready to take all of that away from you. And if you really truly believed, you could be whole. And we have other people in the family who are like, isn't it enough to be taken through that experience Mm -hmm. by God? And I don't 
know exactly what I think, but every time I'm with someone who's close to death or experiencing this um, this corruption maybe, or maybe it's a renewal. I don't know. I was listening to this, and I was listening to him talk about the resurrection of Christ, and I had this image of mushrooms in my head which is bizarre. But I thought about how in the natural world, something dies and then something else is fed by it. And I was like, well, perhaps it's like that, right? Maybe that's what it's about. It's about nurturing other people through our own experience. So they're prepared. Um, Yeah. So I'm still working on some things and trying to work stuff out. But this book definitely helped me. I love that. I'm I'm reading a book called Forgiveness and it's by a professor at the Harvard Divinity School and he's a pastor and he talks about forgiveness as a not a relationship to reconciliation but a relationship to loss and resurrection the same thing we talk a lot about Christ being lifted but Christ had to had to die first and this idea of a, a relationship with Christ permeated by loss and grief instead of this triumph i think is really profound and one that takes particular vision to have right but if if love is permeated by loss and grief and mourning isn't that a more christ-like life anyway i think of all the interactions that we have and at the of christ and at the end those moments he seems to be quite melancholy not excited or exhilarated by raising a dead man or forgiving the adulteress but he's full of sorrow and and loss and grief and i think like Elder Holland says, those Gethsemanes are not to be just tromped through, but really weighted in. And I think, he, and Roar calls forgiveness a largeness of the soul. And I think my soul has only been made larger in moments of incredible loss and grief. And I think we we shy away from that. Um, but I wonder, there's an idea that love requires separation. And I wonder if that separation between us and what we want or that whole feeling that we need is actually completely necessary and inevitable. And that's when our rubber hits the road, our relationship with Christ and our vision of Christ and with Christ comes into fruition in our life. I wonder if I could ask you, Stephen, uh, in your bio, I said that you're a fellow pilgrim on the way. And he talks about love is the way in this book. And I wonder, can you comment on what the way has been for you and and if you connect that phrase with something here in the book? Well, I'd say, I hope it doesn't sound too clever that I said that. But I do kind of <laughs> feel, frankly, like that my life has been a bit of a, a pilgrimage uh, of sorts. Um, it, I consider myself a seeker, somebody who's trying. And, and the earliest right. Christians, before Striving. they were Christians, called themselves follower of, as the followers way. of the way. Right, exactly. And so I, that's definitely what I meant to evoke by saying that. And that way is not necess- is, def- is embodied and it's joyful and sorrowful at the same time. Um, Richard Rohr in this book is talking about how incarnation and resurrection, Jesus and Christ, love and immense suffering are all part of the same whole. The, the way is going to have all of that. Um, it, it, it enters into the full aspect of our human experience, but also transcends that mm. into everything that's around us. And so Pilgrim in the Way for me means that, that we're seeking together or striving together, maybe walking together for a time. Right now we're walking together in this yeah, podcast yeah. episode, um, trying to share the things that are meaningful to us, give each other encouragement, um, all in the hopes that there, the love might abound the more. You know, he says at the, the bottom of page 79, 
Remember, uh, God loves you by becoming you, taking your side in the inner dialogue of self-accusation and defense. We hear of, quote, an adversary or Satan as being an accuser. The part of us that says, oh, I'm not good enough, or oh, I failed in that, or I'm surely not what God had in mind, or <laughs> any of the accusatory things. But he says, God stands with you, not against you, when you're tempted to shame or self-hatred. And here's the line I love. It can be hard to feel it or trust it, depending on authority figures you've had in your life. But you must experience this love at a cellular level at least once. The only thing that separates you from God is the thought that you are separate from God. That gives me a whole bunch to think about. And hope that I either have experienced or that I can have that kind of experience. I'm trying to think back through those moments. I, I can think of you know just a couple brief piercing moments where it's like something almost broke through, but I was so dense, I just sort of noticed that something might have just flitted by, but I wasn't really dwelling in it. Do you have thoughts on that or experiences of that? I think love is the hardest thing to, to feel. I mean, I feel love for people all the time, intense sort of love, but for me it's very hard to feel that I am loved. Yeah. I don't know if I'm doing enough. To, <laughs> and that's my journey and I need to like m- be a better person in so many ways. But yeah, like this this awareness that I'm connected and that I'm loved, that sounds amazing. I would love to know what that's like. Well, Heather, can I jump in? Yeah. I at the end of this same chapter, the same passage, you just mentioned that you're not sure that you're doing enough. And I think that's the thing that we who are hard on ourselves tell ourselves is the reason why we don't feel as much connection or love that we think that we should. Here we are. These words, they're they're dangerous words, right? (laughs) But Richard Rohr reminds us, um, he says, and he's he's using this image of the divine two-step. It's a subject of an entire book that he wrote um, called The Divine Dance. And dancing is really weird. I I hate dancing. I love music. I hate dancing. Dancing for me, the the movement of my body is really deeply like a, uncomfortable in some ways, and you know I don't enter into that very easily. I'm up in my head. Um, it's very hard to to do that. But what he's reminding us here is, um, he says the first motion is always from God, and this is what we call. Is, is grace. We, in our yearning and our searching, think that this is us maybe trying to chase after God, maybe, or right. something like that. We're doing the first thing. But um, it's really the other way around. Like, we, God is the one who takes the first step. Yeah, and, and I believe that. Like, I've told people that many times, right, that God is reaching for you. Mm-hmm. He's always reaching for you. But it is really hard to then in my own brain say, right. God is reaching for me, right? Because <laughs> I'm used to thinking for a variety of reasons. Most of them have to do with my childhood. But, you know, oh, when you're good enough. And he he broaches that, right? We seem to think that the way to maturity is to be mature all the time. But the way to maturity is through immaturity. And so we're we shouldn't expect this perfection of ourselves. We should expect mistakes, you know, and those are ways that we can change and learn. Again, I can say it and I can think it, but the feeling, the experiencing of it is so difficult for me, right? To say, oh, I'm part of that too, right? Yeah, the surrender or the acceptance of it is the vulnerability, the hard part, you know. and And I wonder if it happens when we're not so focused on it. I, my my mom on my mission. I was in Thailand and I struggled really hard at the beginning. I've had like OCD tendencies and it's the opposite of clean there. And I would email her and, and be complaining and she would never comfort me. She would just say, "Play the glad game, be grateful, and look outside yourself and serve someone." And I remember the day I was angry about those emails for a long <laughs> time. <laughs> the day that I finally listened and I stopped thinking about, "Am I happy?" Am I feeling the spirit? Am I loved? Am I being successful? Was the day that I finally was. I think we talk a lot about this a lot, especially in the secular world. It's like, go find yourself. I'm like, where are you expecting to find it? 
in the jungles of some country in Africa or, you know, on in the streets of Bali? Like, isn't it just right here in the world that you live in, that the, where you plant your feet in the proximity to other people? I mean, the times I felt the most reaching from God is when I've been reaching towards another person and not so concerned in my vacuous self about like, am I feeling this thing that I've been told I should feel? It's like, no, I'm, I'm weeding with my grandma. And all of a sudden this, this feeling emerges out of nowhere. And it's like, whoa, he's in me and her and us and this plant and this world that I live in. And so I think we're, a lot of times we're looking at this metaphorical mirror and it's not until we shatter that and we look outside the window of the world and the people that we're with, the experiences that we're asked to be pushed into and the trials that we're asked to suffer, that we really feel that cellular level of God because he can't be found in in this constant analytical like teasing, parsing out ourselves. I don't think it's always found within, but it's when we're pushed outside of ourselves that we're allowed to see and feel that God-like love. You're listening to a book club edition of In Good Faith. The book we're talking about is The Universal Christ by Richard Rohr. We'll be back with more in a moment. This is In Good Faith. We're talking about The Universal Christ, the book by Richard Rohr, How a Forgotten Reality Can Change Everything We See, Hope For, and Believe. Austin, just before the break, you look like you were about to impart wisdom. Well, I follow the Plum Village tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, and he talks about how waves, they're looking for something, but you know what they're looking for is what they're made of. Mm. Uh, the sense that the way to happiness is happiness. Um, that we are what we're looking for, and until we realize it, we won't be satisfied. Um, but when we do, it's like, it was all there all along. And what keeps us in this cycle of pursuit and dissatisfaction is not knowing ourselves or our, our identity. It's an ignorance or... Who, who is it that says, at, it's a famous writer, at the end of all our journey will be to return to the place we began and know it at last. And I think that ties in to real, that what you're looking for is actually what's already in you, if mm -hmm. you can find that. I'm wondering, because we do, we are wrapping up here, or need to wrap up, um, if there are any particular thoughts or sections that were very relevant to you that you'd like to bring up. Well, I, um, I want to bring up the dedication. Hmm. I dedicate this book to my beloved 15-year-old Black Lab Venus, whom I had to release to God while beginning to write this book. So, I think... Whether or not, I think if you read this book, and as with all books, you do not have to agree with everything to find something important. You don't have to, like, take it into yourself and be like, this is my new way of living. Like, I think um, Stephen's already pointed out, you can read this during one phase of your life and have one experience. You can read it again. Um, most great things worth returning to are like that. But I think what this book did for me was made me pay a little bit more attention to what was around me. And I have to say that I was just recently at my sister's, and she has a beautiful black lab who <laughs> just, her name is Lucy. And uh, Lucy is sweet and loving and attentive and hearing Richard Rohr in my head and also thinking, but of course, and I need to pay more attention and I need to, I need to be more thoughtful and not just with easy things like, an affectionate dog who is fawning on me, but with the people around me, pay attention, look around, you know, embrace, be vulnerable. Uh, all of these messages were there for me in this, and I I found it incredibly helpful and um, for where I am right now. Well, I would maybe add also that looking at your dog in love and appreciation is becomes... An orthopraxy. Oh, tell us what that word means. So, if you, you you keep talking about should, right? What you're talking about is right behavior, and you have defined for yourself what are the ways that I need to be to engage in the spiritual life or in please the God. I need to do the right things. Um, I think this is trying to say, hey, everything is 
a mirror, potentially, of the divine love. That mirror allows us to take a dog and not and turn it into Christ for us in the ways that Richard Rohr talks about Venus, his dog. He says that this dog looks at him with you know, utter trust and delights in him more than even the food that you know she could be eating. She'd rather spend time with him doing nothing in his presence. Right. And appreciating that helps us see that all, all of our activities have the potential to do that. So it's less about, am I doing the right thing right now? Am I doing the right number of prayers? Am I going to the right number of meetings or um, participating in the perfect way? The, the, the orthopraxy is expanded to include a lot more right. activities where we see the divine will reflected. Yeah. I think my dog has learned to see the divine in food and will drop me in an instant <laughs> for no. the food. I need, a, I need another dog. I think. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank I you. I love it. One thing that was really interesting to me is he talks about this problem of, quote, darkness. Of sometimes as we mature spiritually, and he, he gives his own examples so that he has sort of felt the presence of God step away from him. And he felt this loneliness or this emptiness, but that he had come over time to figure that God was sort of pulling back from him, like almost creating a vacuum, a space in him, that he had to then find what was going to go in there or what needed to go there, that he started to see this as a process of growth, not God abandons me, but it's like I, the way I thought of it is God took off the training wheels and said, this might be a little scary for a minute. Mm -hmm. But learning to trust, he, he talks about, you know, we hear in the scripture, faith, hope, and love, or faith, hope, and charity as it's often translated, that if to really have faith, you also have to have some love and some hope. To really love, you have to have some faith and some hope. To really have true hope, you have to have some faith and some love. And I, I, I liked those because I thought those can help me fill that space when I have felt a separation or I think I'm the, a, a person who, who's reaching for God or open to God helping me have experiences. And if I go through a time where it feels like there's that distance, that the way I feel that is with faith, hope, and love. I just wanted to share a quote about love. It's on page 70. He says, to move beyond our small-minded uniformity, we have to extend ourselves outward, which our egos always find a threat because it means giving up our separation, superiority, and control. And that struck me um, as <laughs> somebody who sort of digs separation and control. Um, I've run from love faster and more frequently than I would like to have. And uh, to surrender to love, it's, it's a relinquishing and, and a deep vulnerability um, that I am learning and will hopefully get better at. Hmm. Yeah, I loved what uh, Stephen said about orthopraxy versus orthodoxy. I think it's far more easy and convenient to be right than to love. And orthodoxy <laughs> can often f filter us into this world of being right, capital R. And like uh, Austin was saying, relinquishing that for love is maybe my toughest battle. Um, but on top of that, I, I went to this lecture with Mark Rathall, who's a professor at Oxford, but taught here for years of philosophy. He talked about actually not needing belief to be in the body of Christ. And I thought about this for a long time. And what I love about this book is, uh, and it's on the very first line of the Ford, when we argue about religion and theology, we're actually arguing about the kind of world we want to live in. And I would argue the type of people we want to be. I don't need or want to be someone who sees someone in need and says, I believe that my covenants would suggest me to help someone, but instead I want to see someone in need and automatically see them in need and therefore help them. And religion is a place, and he quotes um, Chesterton, where 
it's not about the church you belong to, but the cosmos of which you live in. And I want to inhabit a world where the universal Christ paints my world in certain colors where I see people's needs and suffering and respond to it in a way that's full of love, faith, and hope. And relinquishing the need to know, but instead believe and want things to be true where my behavior and my orientation to the world makes those things true. And I think that's all permeated by the sense of love and not rightness. And Roar has over and over reminded me that it's better, more important, and necessary to love more than it is to be right. And I want to just pull out this one line that he's he's quoting a writer named J.B. Phillips. And he said, in certain situations, I would say, as J.B. Phillips wrote many years ago, your God is too small. And when I see something called the universal Christ, I mean, he wrote this book, I think, so that uh, obviously it's permeated with with the stories of Christianity and with the records of the New Testament. But he is talking about something that's a little bigger and that connects everyone, no matter Christian, a different faith, no faith. And I think there are times each of us could read that and say, I think my God is too small. And maybe that's what has caused some smallness of heart in myself. And if when I see a bigger God or a bigger reach that helps me have that bigger something, that bigger love, bigger hope, bigger faith, uh, I just see God as bigger and starts to include other people too. Thank you all for coming in today. Our guests have been Stephen Nordstrom. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you, Sydney Balif, Austin Bog, and Heather Bigley. Our next book club will take us to Turkey, where we'll be discussing the poetry and influence of Jalal al-Din Muhammad Rumi, the 13th century Afghani mystic. Best known as Rumi, his writings have inspired Muslims for hundreds of years, but in the 1990s entered American consciousness through a number of translations that were promoted by celebrities and academics alike. Our book club episode was produced by Heather Bigley. Our production team includes Leah King, Tanya Lockett, Katerina Martinich. Our sound designers include Daniel Phillips and Dallin Jepson. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, we think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. If you enjoy the show, we hope you leave a comment or a review where you get your podcast. That really helps spread the word. And you can find us on Twitter at In Good Faith Pod and on Instagram and Facebook at In Good Faith Podcast. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Stephen Cap Perry. I hope you join me again soon, right here, In Good Faith.